नमस्ते गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग एंड गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम टू द वेब वेबिनार ऑन ए पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन पीपीपी इन रेलवेज एट द आउटसेट लेट मी थैंक यू ऑल टू स्पेयर योर वैल्यूएबल टाइम in these pandemic times which are prevailing all over the globe in various measures in india we are experiencing a little more my name is naresh bana and i am the host for this round table i am an office bearer at the world association of ppp units and professionals in short wap wap encourages women ppp professionals with robust academic and practical skills to be recognized by the peers in the ppp industry for more information you can refer to our blog on our website which was published on 19th september now allow me to share the webinar technicalities with you and present the sequence of events for the next 60 minutes this webinar is being recorded and is scheduled to finish at 2 pm geneva time we'll make the recording available on the web secretariat youtube channel subsequently the chat function is activated for organizational matters only please use the q and a box for any content queries questions from webinar participants are very welcome we'll try to respond during the webinar but if we can't do that we will come back to you with an email <coughs> sequence of events i will present each speaker ahead of the round table the round table will last approximately 45 minutes and after the round table there will be ample time for a lively exchange with the webinar participants please make use of the q and a box as i am going to be the moderator for this round table allow me to introduce myself i am naresh bana and uh, i am member of the steering committee and executive committee of wap i am also the chair of south asia chapter in addition to being treasurer of the organization <clears throat> i continue to lead the rail ppp project team at unec we together with doris we published the rail ppp standard on 20 november 2018 at palais de nation i am a civil engineer and management expert by training i did a short study at harvard business school in 2010 learning the strategic financing of business having participated in construction of some of the mega transportation projects like kashmir rail project in the team of mr chopra i founded my consultancy in 2011 and have since advised many a corporates and governments for various projects to be developed in ppp mode in 2020 i was recognized by web peers for my capacity i wish us a lively and enriching debate on this highly topical issue ladies and gentlemen the development of railways traditionally has been in the public sector domain considering its potential contribution to economic and social development which is the typical focus of any government railways is capable of high levels of passenger commodities and goods transport with a higher energy efficiency as compared to roads but it's often less flexible and more capital intensive than roads it was only in 1990 that the ppps were introduced in this sector we at wap are always striving to bring contemporary and topical knowledge to ppp practitioners worldwide and this webinar is first in series of railway webinars to give you a perspective on ppp in railways the panel discussion will focus on a number of questions from the moderator in a round table format that will explore the perspective on ppp in railways worldwide 
participants are encouraged to use the question answer box to submit questions which will be answered by the panelists i now have the great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists before i do that i must mention the two of our distinguished panelists have excused themselves due to ongoing pandemic situation our first distinguished panelist is mr rakesh chopra mr rakesh chopra is well known personality in the international railway circles a brilliant civil engineer he graduated from prestigious indian institute of technology delhi and did his masters as well from the same institution subsequently he did his mphil from punjab university pg dpa from indian institute of public administration diploma uh, from iipa certified in project management and finance from orwick and or great britain manchester and stern university usa he is a former board level member of indian railways and ex officio secretary to government of india he has been chairman of several public sector companies and presently sits on board as non functional director and advisor of private sector companies dealing with infrastructure and in transportation including ppp projects metros and airports in india and abroad a business leader with a demonstrable track record of administration management direction and delivering client expect expectations in the private and public sector complete with civil engineering and mep in the construction industry he is also an arbitrator conciliator and a mentor he has worked as a consultant with the world bank as well he has been the general manager of southern railway and divisional railway manager of mumbai and delhi divisions the two most busy and most crucial railway divisions of indian railways he has been the chief administrative officer of jammu and kashmir new railway line project an executive director while with the railway welcome on board sir namaste our second distinguished panelist is ms doris shivali she is an expert consultant in project financing she worked for large private sector groups such as buis vinci and alstom but also worked for the ppp task force of the french ministry of finance doris has over 30 years of experience in project financing in infrastructure and renewable energies she is an expert advisor to european commission to unece and has participated in uic's work on sdgs she has participated in the financing of many high speed metro or tram lines around the world notably among them is lgv tour bordeaux sydney tram milan metro some of which have received awards and she is an expert in ppps and is a member of dispute board resolution foundation welcome madam namaste welcome to the webinar our third panelist is distinguished panelist is elan kusia ba he is the global director of canadian pacific consulting services he is an accomplished infrastructure financial advisor with over 20 years experience in originating structuring and leading complex infrastructure transactions through the project life cycle in africa asia the middle east canada and the uk mr kusia ba started his career with cpcs and subsequently worked for the infrastructure advisory firms at kpmg in uk and for pwc in canada more recently he worked at the world bank group leading ifc's ppp advisory team for west and central africa he has a strong track record of leadership and execution in advising public and private clients in the development procurement and financing of infrastructure projects across the transport power health and water sectors his experience includes a broad range of rail transactions including extensive experience acting as lead advisor on most of the rail concessions mandated in africa in 1990s 2000 and subsequently on rail deals in the middle east uk cis and canada welcome elan welcome to the webinar 
Our fourth distinguished panelist is Xavier. He's a lawyer and CFA. He's the founder of Magellan Finance, a financial advisor specialized in transportation industry. Until March 2021, he was head of the M&A financings and project at Transdev, a well-renowned European company with significant activities in PPP, which is one of them is Horontario in Canada, which is a Euro 3 billion turnover and bids in Colombia and China, structured financing of Euro 300 million of BS rail financings in Germany, innovative structure in France, fundraisings and m and Before he has worked for five years at Bombardier Transportation, accumulating structured finance positions with CFO position and acting as key advisor, notably of El de France Mobility and 10 years at BNP Paribas, where he has arranged Euro 2 billion structured asset financing for our customers as CMA, CGM, Lufthansa, Bombardier or SNCB. He was awarded in 2012 with BNPP as Lee's innovator, lead innovator of the year in the Jane's Award. He also intervenes as guest lecturer at Dauphin University in Paris. Welcome, Xavier. Welcome to the webinar. Okay, let me take you to the first round. And as we all are seeing around us and feeling that railways continue to play a significant role in keeping the economies on move during the pandemic or otherwise moving passengers, essentials, and industrial freight. Pandemic situation has failed to deter the spirit of railways. With that as background, may I request Ms. Chopra that you have an eye on the worldwide railway activity. May I ask you, how do you see PPPs driving the development of railway infrastructure in India? Uh, uh... Good afternoon and good evening, good morning. To start with, I'm reminded of actually uh, Michael Jackson's a very famous number, make it a better place for you and me. With this pandemic, the way this is going, particularly in India now and what is happening, this is a prayer, make it a better place for you and me. And I'm sure that a uh, webinar like this, what Naresh has organized, is going to help us in getting out of that quagmire and look at a better option. See, the Indian railways actually have ventured into the field of PPP long, long back. Much uh, as uh, Naresh said that uh, the world recognized PPP in the 90s. In India, really the first shot of PPP by the railways was in the 70s. It was the first stage when the technology had been imported. We needed to actually improve our track structure and concrete sleepers and elastic fastings were the two things which were imported from Europe. It was a Pandorol clip, which most of the railway people would know about, and the concrete sleepers. We could not import sleepers, but we didn't have the money for that. So it was uh, build and operate model that was operated in the 70s. Railways gave a piece of land and uh, the private sector came in, joined us. They invested money, set up the factories, operated those factories. And uh, since then, they have been supplying the concrete sleepers of various designs and things like that to the Indian railways. And of course, now they are going beyond Indian railways uh, abroad also. And today they have become from small time. Now, that's an important factor I'm telling you. A small, small companies, SMEs as we call them, they were small companies and today they have become big, big people. Following this, uh, the way I look at it in the 70s, India, Indian railways, you know, they, they realized that there was potential and they needed money to grow actually. And uh, what the Indian railways was looking at was, you know, to use the same infrastructure, increase its capacity. So the throughput could be increased without investments of new infrastructure. So the emphasis was really heavily on that, and they created some public sector companies. This was in 70s, when the concept in India of a PPP officially had not yet been initiated, which was in 80s, really later. 
and these companies they started interacting with the private sector but at that stage out of these companies three very important companies got created one of them was the rvnl second one was the railtel and the third was cris one of them dealt with the computers the other dealt with the communication part of it and the third one really dealt with the infrastructure the infrastructure one came up in the mid 70s late 70s uh, beginning of 80s much before again when the ppp the you know the systems had really been set up in india and here was a case where we were having jvs and consultants and uh, creating infrastructure right from the ports indian ports to the hinterland and connecting with the indian railways there so this was a big experiment some of them did well are doing well some of them failed so the failures i'll tell about later if there is time permitting then came of course the railtel railtel has been working in a communication field it has uh, uh, we have today uh, work they are working with google on the railway stations besides that they have actually also conceptualized the concept which the indian railways followed in the very beginning they have gone with small time people for the spread of the broadband into the on a commercial basis into the private sector private sector and beyond into the villages in indian villages taking it there so that is a big game this organization has played in the ppp sector this is again build operate and transfer this is the model that is being uh, followed then some of them it's a build operate model but then beyond this when the 80s came up lot of efforts have been made so you'll see that uh, the indian railways have been trying there has been a, you know indian railways have a serious problem missionary from the mission point of view they are a socio economic organization looking at from the point of view of the fact that we have to cater to the social social aspects and the economic growth of the country which is very necessary but when it comes down to the organization itself and uh, we are questioned about you know the finances it is said that you are a commercial organization so that you know the catch 22 situation in which this organization has been put all along the last 70 years by the government of india has not really allowed it to come out of its shell and go in for big big projects which is happening today now so this instinct and clarity have been there together instinct to create a ppp type of a model but the clarity just not being there as a result what has happened is that over the last few years we have certainly ventured into a little more we have started into the manufacturing area we have gone into the electric engine manufacturing at madhepura and that has been a successful story very successful story that is uh, build operate uh, and then finance and transfer that is going to be the model that the land has been given by the uh, indian railways so uh, one sees there is also been the concept of the dedicated freight corridor which has come in there and that is looking at this area so if you look at the indian railways they have been tinkering and tailoring with it there has been an instinct but without a clarity they have just not been able to get into the grips to provide you uh, providers with a firm platform from which the ppp could take off except uh, for the latest uh, things that have happened now the world class stations where my colleague was supposed to have been on the webinar today but unfortunately because of a pandemic he is not there the indian railway station development corporation and the rlda the rail land development corporation so indian railways are today uh, they are venturing into land monetization in a very very big way uh, station developments and of late you must have heard that indian railways do have and they're looking at passenger trains getting into it and not only passenger trains even the freight terminals now freight terminals these are some of the areas in which uh, the indian railways is now getting into yes we do have problems with the structure of the models that we want we have uh, problems with the financing models the big things and uh, we also have issues actually which uh, probably if the time permits i'll discuss you know in the execution of this ppp models that is a big big problem that we have naresh okay thank you very much for a, such a deep insight sir right from the day when it started in india let me uh, ask doris that uh, as you know in the, the disruption which caused which was caused by the pandemic many of the concessions 
have suffered and uh, they have gone in for certain modifications so kindly share with us what modifications have been adopted by those concessioners possibly where you have some insight and to mitigate the challenges posed by the pandemic situation thank you naresh and um, thank you uh, for inviting me i'm really happy uh, to uh, pursue here the the job that we have been doing together uh, for UNEC, uh, which was uh, mostly appreciated. Um, but this is a very uh, complicated question, the, uh, the, the, the pandemic. And uh, I have to say that it has been uh, um, very specific to, um, to um, each country, depending on the uh, legal environment. Um, and we are fast the last year um, trying to cope up with the uh, consequences of the pandemic. And, and we are not yet there, huh? um, depending on where are the projects, what is the contract and what is the legal environment. For instance, um, in France, um, pandemic is not a force majeure issue. And in other countries of Europe it is, but in France it is not. And uh, as such, you are not entitled to a compensation when you are a concessionaire. So um, basically, it depends entirely on what you had negotiated in your contract and also on the uh, strategy and the policy of your banks and investors to what pandemics. Uh, some are quite cool, some are not. I have seen a very nice behavior from in banks and investors and uh, also very poor. Um, so um, what you have to... Uh, uh, keep in mind also is, um, and this is quite worldwide, the pandemic is really not covered by insurance. So uh, having been there, depending on, uh, on, the, uh, on the legal environment, I will focus on what has been uh, done in France, where um, by law, uh, the, uh, the, the rule of the law is always above the contract. So, um, which is not the case in all countries. In some countries, it goes the other way around. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the information that you've got in the contract is stronger than what is in the, in the law. Um, so uh, here we had some solutions that came uh, directly by the actions of the government generally uh, in response of the pandemic, and that had uh, um, given some benefits to the project. Uh, for instance, we had a protection by, of, of the employment by the government, with measure um, uh, of uh, taking back the, uh, the the payment of the salaries by the uh, the government during the lockdown period, and the concessionaire uh, has been able to benefit from that. By contract, it was a little bit more difficult, and uh, we are used in Europe to have uh, clauses of a financial equilibrium in the financial balance in the in the contract, by which uh, when you have um, kind of market events or pandemic, uh, you are entitled to be restored in the, to, to the financial equilibrium that you had at your base case when you signed the, the, the contract. Uh, and this covers generally quite all enforcing cases with a compensation. Compensations are compensations in terms of extension of times, uh, more rarely in terms of, uh, of cash and, and money. Um, so that's what we've got, both uh, kind of administrative compensation in terms of uh, salaries covered by the government and uh, also uh, financial equilibrium restoration by the fact that we get more years in the concession period. Um, yet this is the easiest part of the pandemic, I should say, because until those measures are enforced and linked to lockdown period, um, this is quite okay. But I think that we might have the worst in front of us with the quite severe economical issues to uh, resume the uh, um, global sector economy. And uh, we will need to uh, reschedule the uh, financing profiles and occasionally, and I've already seen that in some small projects, have a rejection of equity in order to, uh, to keep the project uh, go ahead. Um, so that will need also to have a very strong marketing teasing uh, toward end users uh, to create a safer future. 
and uh, also to reboot uh, to reboot the uh, the revenues and and motivate the people to uh, to uh, go back uh, using transport. And this is something that for the time being we do not have any information on that. And and I have an example for that. Uh, we have our national uh, uh, railway operator SNCF, which is selling five million tickets at a low price. I mean, at this low for France, which is forty uh, euro price per ticket before the summer. That's five million, which is uh, a, a huge number and a very low price. So there are already action to resume the economy, but I mean, we do not know, we do not have uh, enough um, uh, feedback for the time being to elaborate, uh, elaborate a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Doris, for such a, a wonderful insight. And now, Mr. Ilan, I know it's very early in the morning and uh, we appreciate and uh, value the early morning trouble which you have taken to be the distinguished panelist with us. Mm -hmm. May I now ask you and take all of us to Africa that what has been the experience to date from rail concessions in Africa, as you have been extensively working in Africa and African concessions. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Naresh. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, it is, it is a bit early. I, I apologize in advance if you see little people in the back of me perhaps given its early morning uh, routine here in, uh, in Canada, but it's a pleasure to be here. And this topic is close to my heart since I started my career working on rail concessions uh, when the model was being developed. And this model was largely inspired by the experience in Latin America, although there was a largely privatization. But there was a general trend to introduce greater private sector participation in infrastructure. And so what you found is out of 32 countries in sub-Saharan Africa where the model was largely developed, North Africa um, had, a different, uh, had a different approach. Um, with operating railways, and most of the railways in Africa are cape gauge or, or meter gauge. 18 of them uh, opted for a concession arrangement at some time since the early 1990s. And so the first model was called uh, Sitahai, which linked Abidjan and the Ivory Coast to Ouagadougou and Burkina Faso. And that one actually is, is still in operation, generally viewed as a successful model, somehow survived through, through civil war. Um, but as you see in terms of experience, um, there have been others that unfortunately were not uh, quite as successful. And there are basically three types of private sector participation models. Uh, there's management contracts that were introduced, uh, not too many, but a few. There was a hybrid uh, rail concession contract which had more of an affermage approach to it, which follows the, I would say, the, uh, the French civil law system. So Cité is an example where the state takes on more of the, uh, more of the heavy investments. And then the full-blown concession contracts, um, such as the one in Cameroon, Tanzania, uh, which became the predominant initial model uh, when concessioning was first introduced. Now, unfortunately, more than half of those concessions experienced major issues. Uh, seven were canceled, uh, four were, were reassigned, restructured, two were badly affected by, by war and natural disasters. Uh, the process itself, and my role is, as a transaction advisor to government, uh, lived through these concession processes. Uh, they could take three to five years, sometimes a bit longer. Um, so it took a long time to get a signed contract. And sometimes even when you got to the point of award, and there are a few examples like those, uh, and again, I was uh, for better or for worse involved in those, then they just collapsed. And that did not help the image for this model um, and these transactions vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the market. And of course, attracting the market uh, is always key. So whereas the mineral railways are typically efficient, generally financially sustainable, and there are a few examples of that, such as uh, Guinea and, and other comparable countries, um, and concessionaires have generally streamlined operations. Often there are more economical procedures. Traffic did go up in many cases. Some investments were leveraged by the development banks and in some limited form by the private sector, largely in rolling stock. But all too often there was a huge gap between the government expectations of what concessioning could achieve and what actually transported where it was uh, awarded. And uh, I know I have a short amount of time, but I'll just quickly go through some of those uh, challenges. One was the universe of bidders, relatively small even more so in countries, uh, in Francophone countries and Lusophone countries, if you language capability is obviously more limited. So the pool of experts uh, was also quite limited. So that competitive tension at the bidding stage was, uh, was reduced. Most of the early concession agreements put responsibility for financing track maintenance and renewal on the private operators. So when rosy traffic projections failed to materialize in most of the concessions, the concessioners lacked the funds to make those investments in infrastructure renewal. So it was a major department. Governments were felt it was oversold. Uh, They're quite disappointed. And in fact, there's a lot of backlash against PPPs. It was viewed as a, as a failed model. 
uh, even though it had structural challenges and constraints uh, that quite frankly were separate from what PPPs could potentially offer. So a few exceptions, uh, most concessions relied heavily on on lending from the development banks uh, or bilaterals to finance the infrastructure. So whereas they had below market borrowing costs, long tenures and grace periods, they were actually quite slow to mobilize. So very often investments were delayed and of course that meant traffic was, um, was not growing at the rate that was expected. Uh, concessionaires didn't want, did not want to take on passenger services, which in a lot of cases are loss making and need uh, regulated um, subsidies. Uh, and so delays and disputes were often uh, materializing due to the non-payment of the government for these uh, non-profitable services. So that was a huge challenge. And then there were issues around concession fees, high expectations of generating a royalty from these concessions. What it meant is it meant there was disinvestment in the sector because those fees were taken to do other things. General resistance from staff uh, and other stakeholders, they viewed privatization of, of state assets uh, as the model, even though concessioning does not sell uh, state assets. And of course, complex and very costly redundancy programs, given that a lot of the uh, problems in railways was overstaffing. Uh, and so that often was a challenge post concession. Thanks very much. And Thank I you. Can... Thank you, Alan. That was quite elaborate. Let me now ask Mr. Xavier, what are the key challenges you appreciate on the horizon and indicative mitigation plans, only indicative, for financing the railway PPP projects? I think uh, well, clearly the, the key. Uh, for, thank you for inviting me, and uh, and uh, happy to to, to share uh, my thoughts and uh, and discuss together. Um, now, in terms of key challenges, uh, of course, the key challenges is uh, to set the new normal. Is to understand what will be the new normal in the in the in the rail market. Uh, currently, if you if you have the impact of the pandemic in uh, Ile de France in Paris, it is uh, the tra traffic is down by 60 percent uh, just now, and uh, it is not expected that uh, in the medium term the <coughs> the traffic will go back uh, to 100 percent. We think that uh, it will be uh, uh, still down by uh, at least 10 uh, percent because the the crisis has changed. Uh, also, some uh, <coughs> the public behavior, some uh, some habits, and notably we have the introduction of uh, home office that will uh, take uh, some of the commuters uh, out of the train or bus and, uh, and so on. So we have uh, so the, one of the main challenges is to be able to predict what will happen in the next uh, three five. Uh, seven uh, years, and um, and we know that in PPP it's absolutely key, it's absolutely key to have some predictability in the in the model. So uh, so it will be important to to be able to find compromises so that this risk can be borne by the private sector and uh, and that it is possible to have some uh, negotiation with uh, public authorities in case uh, things are not uh, happening as uh, as expected. So I think uh, this. Uh, this new normal is really a, a big challenge. And uh, uh, then I think, uh, but, but uh, to, to, to give a positive note, I think there is also some opportunities in the current crisis. And uh, there is a very strong opportunity for the PPP and the rail sector, which is first, um, we have um, all the countries, we need to have some recovery plan. And uh, we will see that uh, all governments around the world will be uh, incentivized to invest in infrastructure to relaunch the, the economy. So to give uh, two examples, um, in the United States, uh, I think in the, <clears throat> the recovery plan has devoted uh, 175 billion US dollars for the rail uh, sectors. And uh, in France, uh, we see that uh, the um, the high-speed uh, project has been uh, uh, also relaunched. For instance, uh, Toulouse-Bordeaux for um, an, uh, a capex of uh, 8 billion uh, um, euros. So we see that uh, this uh, recovery plan creates a significant opportunity with, uh, for, uh, for PPP project. And uh, alongside the fact that uh, <coughs> the, the crisis has not impacted the financing uh, and the ongoing uh, fundraising that are uh, 
uh, very uh, active in the <coughs> in the infrastructure fund market. So I think uh, infrastructure fund have raised 24 billion US dollars in the, in the first quarter uh, 2021. So we see that uh, the funding are still there. So uh, and they are there for good projects, meaning uh, very well structured project. But we have this uh, this financing that is there. And we have a third very positive trend, which is the environmental the environmental concern, which is also very strong. Uh, the public wants to uh, to have some uh, that the government are launching some uh, green policy, and uh, so the, the rail is also entering into this trend. So, uh, so there is uh, also a big opportunity in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Xavier. Now. Continuing with the financing, you know, there have been a lot of challenges and changes world over and more so in case of transnational railways. And uh, may I ask Ms. Doris that with your experience in certain projects in Europe, could you share some lessons with us? And maybe HSL Zood is one such case. Could you please elaborate on your experiences? Uh, thank, thank you, Narich. I mean, we, effectively, we, we, we did learn a, a, a lot in, in the past decades in France. Uh, you know that in France between uh, 2010 and 2020, it was the place to be for uh, rail PPPs with more than 15 billion uh, euros of rail projects uh, which have been deployed under the PPP scheme, uh, including uh, high speed. And we have more than, uh, I mean, roughly 3,000 uh, kilometers of LGVs in France. Um, HSL uh, Zuid uh, was, uh, is not, Zuid is not in France, we were in France, but there has been a lot of evolutions in that project. Uh, in the PPP scheme itself, which has become far more uh, financialized um, um, since the very early days, but also in the financial market, which has become uh, far more legalized. Um, the, the evolution of the uh, railway project of the past 20 years um, has allowed us, has learned, uh, has allowed us to, to, to draw several lessons. Um, you know, when we when we started a uh, rail PPP in France, we were coming out of a kind of a motorway PPP period. Um, and legal advisor at that time wanted to follow uh, the, the motorway model to, and adapt it to the rail uh, in contract. So um, this was definitely without counting on the specific feature of, uh, of our sector, such as, uh, for example, the obligation of rail safety, uh, which affect equipment and operator and so on. So uh, we, had, uh, we made a lot of mistakes and we learned a lot. Uh, what I can tell uh, from working in many sectors and uh, around PPP is that railways PPP is clearly from far the most complex of, of the PPPs. It has uh, um, particularities which, uh, in my opinion, make it a special case. And that will answer to one of the questions I've seen on, uh, on, the, uh, on the right side. Uh, in my view, it is not standardizable. Uh, it's too difficult, it's too case by case, and it has to be case by case. So um, coming back to what we, uh, we learn, I would uh, highlight uh, mostly uh, six topics. The first one is the, uh, the choice of the economic model of the PPP. Uh, the big question is that should we go for a concession with traffic risk or not? and going more under the uh, availability uh, scheme with a performance range. Really, it depends if you are under an LGV or under a metro. For metro, I do prefer performance range. And for LGV, I think maybe uh, concessions are, are, are better adapted to the, to the structure. The second lesson is the duration of the contract. Uh, in, uh, uh, under PPP financing, the duration of the contract has to be linked with the uh, depreciation period of the uh, underlying assets. I mean, this is one of the uh, rule of success of a PPP. And as you know, a train can uh, take an exceptionally long time. I mean, it can live very long. 
uh, he, uh, I think in France, and Xavier may correct me, we have just put away uh, the TGV, the very first TGV that we put on, on rail on the, uh, back in the 1970s. So um, we can have very long concession period. Uh, HSL Zuid uh, was uh, 30 years year, uh, of contract for my recollection. Tour Bordeaux, uh, which is a contract of uh, 8 billion euros, 7, 8 billion euros, is 50 years. So um, it's quite long. This means that uh, you have to uh, anticipate changes over time within the framework of the contract. And this is really key if you want to have uh, value for money and value for people in the project. And these are changes such as uh, demographic changes, increase in the numbers of transit, and the issue of spare parts, compatibility with new equipment, new technologies, new energy production, and so on. So um, that's really important, and that's allow you also to get the best of the uh, financial market with very long-term uh, financing. I remember that in two, on 2015, we got a financing from our uh, national saving banks, which was uh, 40 years long and with a 20-year grace period at a very low rate. Um, and also, if you're going to get benefit from the bond market, I mean, uh, you, you really need to have a duration of the contract which is long enough. Um, the third lesson is the, uh, the choice of the perimeter of the PPP and the, uh, uh, and the issue of the interfaces between the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, scope of uh, the various stakeholders. Um, for instance, should the rolling stock be included in the perimeter of the PPP? Uh, do you have to add the signaling? Or do you have uh, um, do you need to have a dedicated project for signaling? How do you make the link with that? And in fact, the the, uh, the lesson uh, is always keep in mind what you want to do with your project. I mean, do you want um, to build a rail network, or do you want to provide a service to users? Um, this uh, really change the uh, the structure and the specification of the uh, interfaces risk, which are a key parameter of the PPP, as you know, uh, and, and consequently on the cost of the project. On uh, action sales risk, they decided to have two PPPs, one for construction, one of, for uh, operation, and really they did get lost in the uh, interfaces issues. That, and that, that brought um, dispute, extra cost, extra delays, um, that was key. Um, last point on the perimeter of the PPP, never ever forget about maintenance. Maintenance is key for the success and don't take maintainer at the, uh, at the uh, adjusting factor of the PPP. Maintenance is really key to the success of the PPP. Um, I've got three other lessons learned. Uh, the next one is an easy one, traffic forecast. You find that everywhere in all PPPs. Um, that's what I call buzz, uh, um, flash buzz uh, traffic studies, meaning that uh, they are going uh, to uh, to the sky and even more. Um, Boris, you will have to conclude this part. Yeah, so uh, take care about uh, traffic forecast. Financing, financing needs 50% of public subsidy in railway. And uh, in my view, forget about public guarantee. This is a false good idea. It does not impact very much the cost of funding, and it makes um, contractual documentation very too complex. Thank you. Apologize for being too long. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. No, it was quite detailed. Now let me ask Elan again that what could be learned from your your lessons from Africa, as Doris was. But I request you to keep it a little brief because we have already run short of time. Yeah, thanks, Nirosh. Yeah, I think there's so much to talk about, so it's hard to hold back the enthusiasm. So I'll try to keep it to, uh, to, to about, uh, about two minutes, if that's okay. Um, yeah. In a nutshell, I'll try not to speak too quickly to get it all packed in. I mean, a key takeaway has been the evolution in thinking about what problems a PVP could solve when it comes to bridging the, uh, the funding gaps. You can't just kick the problems down the alley to the private sector and assume that they'll take on all of the risks, the investments. So the next generation of concessions, uh, which did start to appear in the early 2000, did shift that investment burden for these fixed um, heavy investments to government. 
And then the operator focuses investments on, you know, largely rolling stock and, and systems. And you'll see that in other sectors like, you know, container terminal concessions, typically government will cover the heavy, um, you know, key side and, and heavy infrastructure investments and handling equipment, superstructure would be covered. Um, by the concessionaire, and they, they've been largely successful. Um, the other thing is project selection, um, and project preparation is key for any project, more so here, given uh, perhaps the, the experience in, in the past, political leadership, with the stamina to see a project through, and then so choosing the right project, and typically that's for distances of at least 500 kilometers, given the competition with road, um, is really key. And also the uh, nexus between road investment and rail investment. The railways really suffered uh, given that most investments went into road and that chipped away at market share in rail. So having uh, a balanced uh, policy for the transport sector generally and how you parse investments between road and rail will give uh, this sector the, the chance that it requires. The other uh, point is uh, beyond a well-structured agreement with proper risk allocation, government also needs to supervise the concessionaire to ensure it carries out its obligations. That was often Thank a you. feature um, in the concessions that didn't succeed. I can keep going, but I know you want me to stop, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Elan. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that part. Now, may I ask, may I ask uh, Xavier, uh, what are the key considerations which you identify while planning to finance the transnational railway, uh, where the currency union between the two countries may or may not exist? If, just quickly, if you can. Uh, uh, well, I just uh, have no direct experience, but uh, I can share a bit my uh, my thought as a professional. The first uh, thought is that uh, I think the main uh, issue is not the technical one. Uh, to give a, an instance, I think the Thales uh, train, which is going from uh, Paris to Brussels and Cologne, uh, is uh, going through seven uh, sig different signaling uh, systems and four uh, different electric uh, voltage. So uh, in terms of techniques, uh, the manufacturers are there to adapt and they can uh, do some flexible solution. Uh, there, the problem, I think, for a transnational um, project is more um, when you have a PPP, you have to, uh, to have a very clear and strong governance structure with a very strong public authorities. And uh, when you put different countries together, it can be a real challenge to, to have this kind of strong governance. So the big issue would be uh, how do you make sure that you have a public authority that has a clear, um, clear power and clear, uh, that is able to provide a very clear and uh, unstable uh, framework. And uh, across uh, countries, I think it can be a real challenge. So I think, uh, so for me, there is two possibilities. First one is that to have an entity that has some independent uh, revenue stream to finance the project. It's one possibility. And in this case, it means that thanks to this additional revenue, it, it can, uh, it can uh, pilot the project properly. Or, or, or you can choose to have more uh, smaller project uh, in each country and make sure that to, co to, to coordinate properly between the country. And I think it's the best way to make sure that the pub local public authority has, has full power to do things properly and, and to be able to, to move the project forward. So for me, it's more of a key question is really a governance, to have a proper governance to make sure that the project is, uh, is ongoing. And then in terms of currency or financing, uh, banks are, can be quite adapt flexible if the project has been well uh, built and designed. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Xavier. That was quite a comprehensive and nicely packed reply. Now, uh, Chopra, sir, you have been talking about the success and less than success of PPPs. Could you uh, please elaborate a little bit on that, that some of them are called successful and some may not be so successful. What lessons are there for PPP practitioners. Yes, sir. Very interesting. I think Doris and uh, Xavier did cover a lot of it, really. That is what uh, has been our observations uh, in on the Indian Railways also. Uh, but beyond that, I'll just take you for a moment onto the problems which are very different, which have not been uh, discussed. And one of them is really the initial assessment of the project. You know, that is where the input really goes in. Unfortunately, on the Indian Railways, it has been taking over two decades. You know, for instance, the world-class stations we have been talking of way back in 80s, it started and still, or maybe three decades now. 
we are still struggling with that now one of the reasons for that was that we have just not been able to figure out the model the concession agreement what do we want to have how do we want to go about it and the period and everything that uh, is involved in that at the same time now that uh, the rfp and rfq are out of for some of them what is interesting to find out is that the delays are still taking place in finalizing that and uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the assessments that have been made are quite debatable so these were some functions you know which uh, have been uh, brought out by doris have been brought out by zebier as well as ran there so i think those were some of them the governance and the project management i entirely agree on the indian railways really the failure has been uh, seen to be really on the governance of uh, the projects a uh, similar type of projects from the port some have failed miserably others haven't wherever the governance has been there and professional i would just put in there that uh, um, there have been opportunities and situations where the the board of directors could have easily appointed the the managing director of the company but it has not been done for years and uh, the company has just not gone ahead so those are uh, some of the things that are beginning to show up on the indian railway scenario also the next most important that i find there is because of this factor that uh, you have too many concessioners and port uh, railways for instance has become a, a small unit of railways itself there is a need for a regulator so i would like uh, you know that uh, there is this is uh, examined in detail and i think there needs to be a study on this fact that a regulator of a, a sort is very very necessary for this if you allow this to go on the boards of uh, some of these organizations are uh, are are not really involved in the working so we have seen lot of failures that have been coming up uh, from this uh, domain also in the last instance which uh, my colleague uh, mr loya who is unfortunately not here would have certainly dealt with is the world class stations now what happens in the world class stations there is the concept of a tod we are looking at the concept of a tod the tod requires lot of uh, regulations that need to be changed and modified while that is acceptable within the bounds of the railway land now that is what is beginning to be seen it is acceptable within the bounds of the railway land by the government here but you know the moment you interact with the government outside the civil uh, government outside for the roads for the power for the drainage purposes for uh, the the passengers inflow outflow uh, there is a distinct you know no no there so this diff this sort of a resolution needs to be there and when i say resolution needs to be there i i am reminded of the fact that in way down in um, australia they have a concept of an alliance contract and i'm sure many of you all would have uh, dealt with those contracts the fundamentals of the alliance contract really help out i feel they could be of a great help somewhere in uh, managing a ppp contract and that is yet another thing which i feel needs to be introduced somewhere in the concession where the people do understand and realize that this is going to be a long term thing there has to be a inward sort of a look by all the participants and all the stakeholders that there are which is not uh, happening today so these were some of the thoughts you know besides what doris and uh, xavier and elan had said i thought i would share with you thank, thank you. you sir thank you now doris a very quick take on uh, rolling stock experience and the ppp could you just uh, yeah i mean That, that has been quite successful, uh, um, and, and basically, and it's coming more and more successful. Uh, the, uh, we 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 had some uh, work work companies uh, back in the uh, uh, in um, um, that was maybe now ten to fifteen years ago um, that were not as strong as now because uh, they did not include. uh enough uh rolling stock in there and it in the maintenance but it's quite profitable and and more and more it goes to the to the way of the privatization of the uh of the rolling stock market so uh definitely i found that uh ppp is very well uh, adapted uh to the rail industry and they are we are now able to identify uh, the 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 key uh factors of success of the ppp quite easily i do uh, concur to what has just been said before we need some regulation and we still need uh, to um, to de de financialize the uh, the ppp tool to come back to uh, to the project itself 
And this is the work that we are doing with the United Nations, with the People First PPP. So that's quite important. I would say that uh, trams uh, projects are the easier when you start uh, doing a PPP in railway, but it works uh, pretty well uh, for uh, rolling stock and, uh, and, uh, and high speed. And, and then, I mean, as a conclusion, and a very good conclusion, I mean, for investors uh, which are maybe in the audience, I mean, this sector is not highly profitable, as you might say, but it's very stable. So uh, for investors, it's quite attractive because you are low but stable, and this attracts more and more long-term investors, such as uh, pension funds. Now, distinguished panelists, the discussion is so interesting that we can go on and on and on. <laughs> but there is a, a time limit, and we have to respect that. And uh, with that, uh, may I now uh, open the Q&A box and see what are the questions. And uh, let's see. There is a question by Vinay Mangrulkar. And he has actually put in three questions, which are talking about the effect of pandemic. And uh, interestingly, he asks about uh, integrating railways and seaway PPP for economies of a country. Uh, Mr. Chopra, sir, could you take that on? Yes, in the pandemic, let's take his questions one by one quickly. Uh, in the During the pandemic, uh, insofar as uh, the PPP is concerned, I have not found any really let up in that. For instance, uh, the way the things are going for uh, some of the projects that uh, there are uh, in the offing and which are already working. For instance, in the manufacturing of the uh, electric engines, there has been no let up. We have really met with the targets that is really happening. So that is one uh, positive aspect of it. Similarly, for the world-class stations also, I feel the work really because uh, working from home and there is uh, really a lot of technical work involved in the preparation and is on a legal, technical, as well as the framework for the concession agreements and uh, the thing. What has really suffered due to the pandemic in the preparation of all this is the research that is required in the field. So the field research, field visits that have not hampered. But I think otherwise, uh, yes, other than the fact that when there have been lockdowns and there is no movement outside, that has restricted a little bit of it, but uh, the work where it is there has been going on well. Uh, Concord in India has been working pretty well. Your own your wagon scheme has been still going on. The point that is made about uh, the participation, yes, there is an organization called CIMT. There is already a look at, you know, combining the two that is coming up. How that evolves is yet to be seen. Thank you, sir. Now the next question is specifically to Doris and asked by Mark Said. And he's asking, was there any ITC type PPP arrangement in France? Um, yes, yes, we had, we had a GSMR, I mean, a GSMR rail project. I mean, that's an ugly name, sorry for that. Uh, which was basically a PPP from my recollection. It was more than 15 years. And it was about implementing uh, ERTMS signaling uh, all over France and to get interconnections of the trains under a PPP scheme. And it was very well done and, and, and it was quite a success. And, and far more easy to implement it than, than, the, uh, than, than the LGVs, which were more complicated. But yes, uh, we, we did that. And uh, I know that the European Commission is also uh, pushing to have more uh, ERTMS upgrading uh, projects uh, developed under PPP scheme. We had also in Spain, uh, one which was called uh, one, um, an ITC uh, project to upgrade the uh, Albacete, the LGV uh, line Albacete Alicante, which became a case study for the European Commission. Okay, thank you. The next question is to Elan, and uh, it is Mr. Morris is asking, and where is the question gone? Okay. Ah. No, I think it's uh, deleted by him. Now let's go to the next question. And that is from Sanjeev Verma. Could we implement PPP in part rather integrated so that small company may also participate? 
Elan, could you like to answer that? Sorry, the, Elan, the line was cutting. Sorry, I apologize. The line was cutting. Could, could you repeat the okay. question? Sorry, the internet. The question was, is uh, that uh, instead of a comprehensive PPP contract, could we implement PPP in parts uh, in the entire railway complex system? So he's basically seeking that it should be implemented in parts, like for track, for rolling stock, like that. So uh, I think you... I, I, you I'd have... say the, the, the short answer is possibly, but it's all about scale. Uh, a live example would be, I was involved in looking at Swaziland Railway um, and looking at opportunities for bringing in local contractors. And they did find ways to subcontract, but typically it was around maintenance, um, anything that required heavy investment by, by local uh, companies was difficult, just given the scale. Um, so in some areas, yes, and very often the, those could have also been railway workers that were made redundant, created companies, and then served the railways. So in limited form, yes. Um, I would say large scale, I mean, we do see, you know, rolling stock leasing, uh, but again, those tend to be large companies, but that can be broken down as, as one component uh, of a PPP. Uh, track maintenance um, could also be one. Whether you call it a PPP or more of, a, of an outsourcing contract, I guess depends on how one wants to define it uh, within a particular uh, jurisdiction. Um, so yes, it is possible to to segment, uh, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to to compensate um, the private uh, provider of, of the service. Um, and in particular, if there's financing, scale is is important. So it'll, it'll depend on the uh, on the context. Suresh, if I may, if I might quickly add, uh, yeah. yes, I, I firmly believe on the Indian railways, the way it has been tried and what has been successful is the small models, breaking it down. As I said, the manufacturing of concrete sleepers and the fittings was one. Uh, along with the track machines maintenance, what Alan just mentioned, the maintenance uh, purely of the track through the track machines and uh, their maintenance, maintenance of the track machines, because unlike in Europe, the uh, machines in, uh, on the Indian railways are owned by the Indian railways. So that itself becomes a model. So yes, I think uh, uh, on the Indian railways, this is suddenly being tried and uh, success is there. Okay, there is one uh, question about the PPPs in uh, Africa and it is addressed to Mr. Elan that given the low level of user income in many African countries, how will a railway PPP project come to be commercially acceptable? And we have already shot past the time, so I would request this. Yeah, well, I, I, and I provided a, a short a short response in writing. I mean, the, the reality is Africa bears the highest logistic costs, you know, worldwide, whether it's getting container through a port, going into a hinterland country like Burkina Faso or, or Chad. So I think the initial answer is not very satisfactory. End users are bearing that cost, you know, anyhow. So the key is efficient use and deployment of funds that are invested to bring the cost down. So where it's justified economically, financially, those are the projects that merit investment. Uh, large scale, expensive projects, there's a big trend towards standard gauge rail, which might make sense, but does it make sense if you've already got an existing narrow gauge rail? And therefore the investment costs are at this level uh, and not two or three times higher as is the case with standard gauge rail, that will make the end user costs lower. So good project selection is, is obviously key in bringing the cost. Thank you, down. thank you, Ilan. And with that, we come to an end of uh, question and answer session and uh, if I may uh, try and sum it up that if we have to identify the quote for the day is basically what Mr. Chopra said that and he quoted Michael Jackson with your permission sir and he quoted make it a better place so let's try and make it a better place in these difficult times around the world. And uh, I can tell you the discussion was so lively, so insightful and uh, coming out from all the experts, I think it was really beneficial to all the participants here. I am myself feeling so enriched and uh, uh, it's wonderful that all of you could spare your valuable time and uh, I'm thankful to all the participants, delegates, attendees who have also been here all through without whom 
this webinar would not have been as successful as it is now. Thank you very much, all of you. And uh, with that, may I now say bye bye, namaste, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to Elan.